Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, appreciate the great turnout. Um, a quick reminder, we do these events and they're named Liberty and Energy, not the company name, Liberty and Energy, which we think are the two things that just transform the world. The rise of bottom-up social organization, human liberty, and the explosion in available energy, all in the last 200 years, is what drove life expectancy from 30 years throughout all of human history to over 70 years today. So, and, and people don't think about those two subjects today when they think about what's making the world better or worse or whatever. We get, in, we get into the weeds. So we wanna keep bringing people back to the centrality of these two concepts, human liberty and energy. And speaker today, sometimes our speakers focus in one area or the other area, but Magat, who's simply outstanding, she's really about both, very much about both. As you'll hear, she grew up in Africa, and what's missing, liberty, doesn't mean anarchy. Anarchy's the opposite of liberty. That's the rule of the jungle, no one owns anything, no one has freedom, no one has security to pursue their dreams. So it's critical that you have secure property rights and freedom, human liberty, to, to pursue whatever your dreams are and to make the world a better place, and energy. So our speaker today, I'm gonna let her tell her story, so my intro will be super brief, but just a fabulous gal I've known from afar for a few years, only known her personally the last year or so, uh, but she's become uh, not just a co-crusader in pro-freedom, pro-energy, but really a close friend, and in fact, a business partner at a venture we're doing together in, an Af in Africa, and another venture, our Bettering Human Lives Foundation that she's passionate about, and also a partner with us. Um, so every, there is a copy of the, her book, Heart of a Cheetah, for everyone here. If it's not at your table, they're on tables, they're out there. Um, so I got, and, and I call her, uh, sometimes I call her Jaguar or Bobcat or whatever, but Think a predator, strong, powerful cat who's out there to rule the roost. Magat Wade. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris, and good morning, everyone, for having me. I will go ahead and say it right, right now. Um, English is only my fourth language, so sometimes you'll hear me stumble upon words or put them in the wrong order. When that happens, act like nothing happened, okay? <laughs> so thank you. Um, well, again, thank you so much, Chris, for having me. Thanks to the entire staff at Liberty Ventures, you know. I saw that Izzy was here, as well as, um, um, I, you know, I met Ivy today as well, and, uh, my friend over there is right there, Audrey. I always know because Audrey, I have another name for you in my mind, and it's so mu it messes me up because I have a different name for you. I'll tell you after we're done. So Audrey is right there. Anyway, so with that in mind, look, it's breakfast. It's breakfast, and I'm just gonna do what I do is share my story with you, and you will take from it what you will. But uh, when Chris said that um, liberty and energy. Powerful combo. I call it, it's the only combo that humans can run on. That's the only thing at the end of the day that we need. Because from there, we can figure anything out pretty much. So I was born in Senegal, the west coast of Africa. And right when I was around age two, my family made the very, very painful decision that so many African parents before them have made and so many African parents to this day are making. How, who here has children? Whether they're very tiny, older, who here has children? Lucky use. Well, imagine your child is two, and the best thing you can do for her is to actually leave her behind. Who here had to ever do that? No one. Who here could imagine having to do that? And you leave and you don't know when you're gonna be back. You don't know when you'll see them again. All you know is that some very important um, steps of their lives are gonna happen behind your back, but yet, this is the very best you can do for your child. This is the ultimate sacrifice you can make for your child. In this case, my parents made that choice, why? Because we're from Senegal, a nation that sadly, to this day, is famous, famous for being one of the 25 poorest countries in the world. So my parents knew that if they don't do something different, it's not gonna happen for me. 
So they made the painful decision to go, and they left me behind because on a journey like that, when you don't know really how it's going to go, when you don't know what you're going to find on the other side, the last thing a child needs is, uh, um, what do you call it, instability. So they said, we're going to keep you behind, you're going to stay with grandma, we go. And that's what they did. Eventually, they went to um, France and then went to Germany. And around that time when they were in Germany, it was some five years later, the immigration journey had worked for them, and they called for me to be reunited with them. So there, for the second time, happened something for me where I'm being separated from my caretaker. The first time, it was parents had to go. Now, this time, it's had to, I had to leave my beloved grandmother behind. And um, maybe some of your grandparents, I know, Chris, you are. Imagine all of a sudden your granddaughter is leaving, now I know it's a grandson, and you, you don't know when you'll ever see him again. You don't know if you'll see him again, but you know this is the best thing for him, so you let go. Um, that was my story. And um, my grandma, I loved my grandma. I loved, loved, loved my grandma, but I had to go. And so, but grandma said to me, she said two things, she said, baby, when you're going to go there, you're going to see, we're going to go to a place where most people don't look like you. Most people don't speak the language you speak. And unlike many of the kids, you, would not, you didn't go to school. I was a free range kid. I did not want to go to school. Grandma said, leave her alone. She's not going to school. So I don't go to school. But right around age seven, my parents were freaked out a little bit. So in any case, uh, she said, but where are you going? The pe these people are going to be different from you because perhaps they have a different skin color. But it is still human skin and you're a human being, so that doesn't matter. And she said, we're gonna speak a different language from you, but it's still a human language, a language spoken by humans. They're human, you're human. Surely enough, you'll figure it out. And she said, going to school is what little humans do, and you're a little human. You have not done it yet, but you figure it out. And with that, she set me off. And uh, when I arrived in Germany, surely, surely, all of these eyes, pairs of eyes looking at me, literally, I think in the whole school, I was the only little black kid. And all of these kids looking at me, they were so curious, you know. And I love it as kids, you know, when others look at you differently or weirdly, you don't feel it. You're just like, oh, well, well, I guess you're weird too. And then eventually we, we meet somewhere. Anyway, so we, I go to Germany and grandma, everything grandma said was true. They're white, I'm black, but hey, we can get, get along still. They speak this uh, German language and um, I don't speak it fine. School, all of that. Well, within six months, I was at the top of my class speaking a flawless German and there you had it, grandma was completely right. So for me, it really set me on a path and that will matter for going forward because grandma always said, it is okay for you to be impressed by any of that, kids going to school, whatever, but do not be intimidated. And she always chose her words very carefully. In her mind, it was important for me to realize that I was just as good as anybody else, if not better. So never feel, you know, down on yourself. And this to me matters a lot, especially in these times of DEI that we live in, in the US. I absolutely have very, and if some people disagree with me here, sorry, it's, you know, I'm sure by now you will know that there are some things that I just don't buy into. I really believe in agency. I really believe that us humans can do pretty much anything. And I don't believe that my skin color is gonna stop me. Even if somebody else wanted uh, that to stand in the way, I don't have to be, to go by that person's rules or not wanting me to get somewhere. So who cares? I'm just gonna make it. You better get out of my way if you don't, you know what I mean? So anyway, so there we go. Now, you have to understand, when I arrived in Germany, I was seven. But the one question that popped in my head as I, ste as I stepped out of this airport was, I looked around, I'm like, how come these people have this and we don't? And really, all I was talking about was, how come back home, when it's time for me to take my shower, Grandma, you know, within the moment, and within the moment Grandma and I made the decision I'm going to have my shower, it can go a good 45 minutes to an hour before that water actually touches my skin. Why is that? Why? Not because I was a procrastinator, not wanting to get into the bath, as many kids do. No, in my case, Grandma simply had to get a, po a, a, a um, stove of coal going. Imagine, and I'm not talking about even you, you know, when you're doing your barbecue, you have a chimney and you're cheating a little bit and you're getting it faster. No, no, no. She's 
you know, putting the coal in there, fanning it off, breathing all the fumes, you know, in, like literally frying her lungs like so many African women are doing it whenever they're preparing this or making, you know, lunches or dinners for us. And then after, put a pot of water on it, wait for it to boil, then transfer that boil, boiling water into a bigger bucket, mix it with colder water to make it temperature, you know, uh, safe for me. And then somebody stronger will drag it to the shower area. And there at last, some 45 minutes to an hour later, I can proceed to take my shower using a little, you know, uh, plastic cup to transfer back and forth to my body. Now here compare in Germany, mom says, my God, time for your shower. I'm like, where is the bucket of water? I am not getting butt naked in this cold weather. Where is it? And she's like, oh, come on, you silly, just jump in. So I'm like, whoa, okay, jump in the shower, turn the knobs around, the water's coming down at the temperature I want, the pressure even I want, and I'm like, no. Now, now this is real voodoo. <laughs> and my mom is like, oh my God. Anyway, but guys, just imagine that. Just imagine that. And it was not just that. It was also the paved roads. Home, every time my feet get ashy because there is no paved roads. And then the minute I get home, I just have to wash. And then, you know, like, yeah. I guess what I was talking about was the ease of life. It's like, are you kidding me? Really? Seriously? And then, and then the question was, how come they have this and we don't? And you know how kids can be very obsessed with, with a question? I was that kid and I'm still that kid. <laughs> and the question was, how come they have this and we don't? I had to know. My whole life revolved around getting the answer to that question. And um, eventually the question became, how come some countries like mine and so many in Africa are poor, while nations like the United States, New Zealand, Australia are rich? Why? I've heard it all. I've heard people to this day with a very straight face invoke the IQ fury. Oh, darling, it's not your fault. It's just that blacks and browns are simply not as smart as white people. And it shows in Africa to this day. Um, people saying, shoes, you don't have shoes, that's why you're poor. Some say malnourishment. Some say lack of education. And I'm thinking, none of it makes sense. Because if it was lack of education, how do you explain this kid right here? When you go to Dakar, the capital city of my country, you're trying to go from point A to point B, and you have these, uh, these uh, street sellers. Pretty much you can buy pretty much anything on the street like that. They'll have, some people even have iron, you know, iron boards, all of that stuff on their backs. You know? And you can pretty much buy anything. And they're going through the cars, you know, smelling the fumes under the hot, scorching sun, and they're trying to sell you something. If it was about education, you'd tell me how come this person, who happens to be, to have a graduate degree in math, in math, is doing this. How many more degrees do you think this person needs? And likewise, half of all the graduate students we get out of African universities don't find a job. And actually, the more educated you are, the less likely you are to get a job. So please come again and tell me that it's just because I need more education. And as for everything else, the IQ, everything else, it makes no sense because if it made any sense, how come the same people, my parents, the minute they leave my country and they get to another one, all of a sudden they can self-actualize. How come? It's the same people. So all the stuff you're telling me, none of it makes sense. And so I'm starting to think it's not about these people, but the only variable in this equation is the place that they happen to be in or not. So now I want to know, what is it about these places that depending on where you are, you get to make it or not? So I was making progress, and life goes on. From Germany, we go to France, because the family decided we're going to stay in Europe. And because France, and you know, deep, uh, the ties with uh, Senegal, because we used to be the colony of um, France, parents decided to move to France. And then after business school in France, I decided that France was going to be too small for my ambitions. So I got the hell out. I got the hell out and I got to America. Because, you know, I was watching all of these movies. And the one place I wanted to be in was San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. <laughs> and eventually, only God knew it. But later on, I would indeed go to my dream city. 
And as they say, I left my heart in San Francisco. <laughs> so move back. But before that happened, I came to the US and I landed in Columbus, Indiana at first. And my friends were making fun of me because they're like, what, you're going to this place where there's more cows and churches than there are people? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to America, I don't care. So I went to America and I say this part because in life, none of us gets anything done alone. You see, I believe that um, I'm a person of faith and I believe that God manifest his grace. We're not seeing God right now here, but God manifests his grace in having me connect with Chris, having me be with Michael, Audrey, Izzy. That's how God manifests his grace, through other human beings. My favorite saying is, nit nite garabam. It's a well-off word, my native language, and it means the cure for mankind is mankind. And for me, it's another way that, grace, uh, that God exercises his grace. And there in Columbus, Indiana, grace was there all around me. I met this couple, Carol and Eldon Wentz. I will always say their name. And they're the people that later on I learned the rest of America, especially the um, coastal elites, would want to make me believe that these are people who don't like me because maybe I'm black or whatever. Man, these people have literally laid their lives for me. They got me set up with my H-1B visa, everything, paid for everything, connected me to their church, uh, my first apartment. You have no idea how much of a choice I had from people who had homes, apartments from the church, and everybody just wanted to be part of a journey. It was not about handouts. I was paying my rent and all of that stuff, but it was just about people showing up for others. And for me, this is important to say. And I will use this opportunity to say that I love this country. And when I became naturalized, I meant every single word of my pledge of allegiance to the United States of America. What this country has achieved is rather amazing. And what this country has, is and has been is also the proof of what you're gonna hear about the rest of the story. So anyway, so there in Columbus, Indiana, I got hired to, uh, Carol and Eldon had a small, you know, uh, automotive industry um, company, and within nine months, it was very clear that I had um, outgrown my job. And Carol said, look, my God, we could be selfish and keep you here forever with us because we love you. Or we could do what loving parents, which they consider themselves to be, do. There is a much bigger, brighter future for you. And it's not here. We can't provide it for you because it's just too big. And I was like, what are you talking about? And back then, I was, I was engaged to this other French guy who basically followed me because, you know, when I was going to America, remember, I made this decision, right? And he's like, what happens if I don't go with you? Well, I don't know. Will we still be uh, together? Well, I don't know. Should I come? If you want us to stay together, maybe you should. So the guy came. came. We got engaged, and Carol and Eldon, I could tell, they were like, this guy, Bad news. But the last thing to tell me is bad news, because you say bad news, I go there. So she's like, my God, okay. You know that gentleman you always talk about, Emmanuel? You know, the other one that I met in business school in France? I, I, I sent something. Before you, get, before you move in with this, just give yourself a chance. Go for a weekend, hang out, and come back. Once you come back, anything you want to do, we will support you. Even if it's marrying that girl guy, we don't like him, but we'll do it anyway if that's what you want to do. I went. I left my heart in San Francisco. So I went back, gave up on everything. It was the silliest thing to do because H-1B is attached, you know, that visa is attached to the job you have. By me giving up my job, I have to start everything over. Everything over. But I trusted God, and I trusted myself, and God delivered. And so I went to California. With Emmanuel, we started. He had a small business, eventually became much bigger. And um, we were just living our life there in California, in Silicon Valley. And me, I was, I was a headhunter in finance for companies like Google and Netflix before they became household name brands. I got lost so many times going to this tiny San, South San Jose office of Netflix, it's not even a joke. And to see today what it has become, it's amazing. But there I was, in Silicon Valley, in the thick of it, in the heart of it, and experiencing this thing called entrepreneurship. And I was a headhunter doing extremely well for myself given the circumstances. At 25, I bought my first home in one of the most 
coveted zip code in America. And yet, yet, something did not work for me. So this one day, as many days, I was driving down Big Sur on Highway 1, down to Big Sur on Highway 1, and um, I was so happy. It's one of those moments where you were basically taking a tally on how far you've gone. Little girl, my God, barely wearing shoes back home, here in Silicon Valley, just, I mean, she's living the life. So happy, you know, feeling such vindication. At the same time, such gratitude for all the people who showed up in my life, for all the people who have made this possible. And listening to this music that I love from my country, always this connection. The sunroof of the car was open, and everything was great. Everything was great. You can only imagine the, the feeling of elation. And yet, as so often would happen to me, as I would say, as it would happen every time I was in that state, the next second, it's like a switch goes off in my brain. Everything goes dark. So you go from the light to darkness. And it's not just darkness, it's pain. It's deep pain. Where did it come from? It come from the fact that the story and what haunts me, because I'm a haunted person, I have to admit to you, and I believe I will die this way. But at least I'm working towards, towards a solution. Um, then I want to ask you, would you not be haunted if from the moment you can remember having a conscience, meaning you're you know, seven or, or so, all the stories that you hear of is for people, young people from your country, packing themselves into little fishermen's boats, trying to cross over to Europe in search of a job. Most of them don't make it. Most of them are at the bottom of the ocean right now, serving us fish food. And when the sea route is too dangerous, they say we're gonna go land route. And then land route, many of them get stuck in Libya. Being stuck in Libya means you're gonna be sold as a slave, 21st century. It took for CNN to talk about it for them to believe what we were telling them. Because I'm part of some WhatsApp groups where we're literally buying back the freedom of those of us who have been caught there. This is my reality. And when, when sea route is no good, land route is no good, then people take air route and people think it's a good idea to hide on the landing gear of a plane, such that somewhere above England, a body drops. Or that when it arrives in Charles de Gaulle in Paris, you open the cargo section of a plane, and there you have a frozen, frozen dead body, because they didn't know that when the plane gets up there, it gets super cold, no one can survive it. So I ask you, would you not be haunted if you were me? And I ask you, if you are a normally constituted person, how then can you have that a humongous feeling of happiness and yet be able to dissociate your fate from the fate of others. The only difference between them and me is because somehow my parents were successful on their journey to get the fuck out. Excuse my bad words. So I can't have joy when this is what's going on. So yeah. You're happy, the next second, you're a mess. That day, my body was shaking, shaking. So much that the steering wheel almost, ah, the car jerked. Down below, it was the ocean. I, I, I'm not supposed to be here talking to you right now, honestly. If you were there, it was a scary moment. And the minute I could, I, I stopped the car. And uh, I got on my knees because I had no more strength left, literally. But it was my calling to God moment. And I said, God, from here on, I, I surrender. All I could do was to surrender. And I said, I don't know what to do, but I promise you that every breath I take in this world is gonna go towards the betterment of my continent and my people. You show me the way, I don't know what to do, but you show me the way. And uh, it doesn't matter how many times I tell this story, I think until I die, it's gonna get to me this way. That's why I try not to get there, because it's a lot. I'm not like any other speaker, when I speak, Take it from me. That's why I don't want to talk just to anyone. So, I got out of the car, fell to my knees, and I made a deal with God. And something really interesting happened. The sense of peace I felt then was among us. I said nothing. Went back in the car, drove back home. 
in my heart knowing that nothing would ever be the same again. And sure enough, nothing was the same ever again. And I think what happened to me at that time, I talked to some therapists about it, and they said, you know, my spiritual leader will explain it differently with God in it, but the therapist would say, you know, the mind has an amazing ability to make sense of pretty much anything. That's how you have Nazis having done all the nasty things they did, and they still have a way to justify it to themselves. But they said, yet, but the body doesn't have that, that capacity. And he said, that day you had a split between your mind and your body. Your mind had built up some techniques to, to cope with this. But your body that, that day said, I'm done. This is not happening. We're, you're on your own. This is, we have to do something about it. And so that's how it happened. And um, so from that moment on, went home and then decided eventually to go back to Senegal because um, my visas, everything was kind of done. I had just gotten married to now Emmanuel, my sweetheart, remember him? Well, we started, uh, after his business, I started my own business, right? Because I, I went back home to Senegal to show him where I came from. So there's this beverage that I grew up with and it was disappearing. And the women who were the ones who used to grow the hibiscus, the key ingredient, were losing their livelihoods and, pack, and leaving the countryside and going and packing themselves into cities. And uh, being very unhappy there, serving as uh, servants, being treated very badly. So I got angry because these women living in more poverty and also my culture, this drink, is part of my heritage disappearing as well. Because everybody who's made it thinks the right thing to do is to drink Western soda pop brands, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Fanta. And the people at the bottom of the pyramid, they think to show status, you, you drink knockoff brands of those brands. In the middle, we get squeezed out. Where do you go? <laughs> Again, crazy Magat, who gets upset about everything, lost it. But that's why I started my company. I tell people, I don't, I don't, I think many business people, I'm sure many of you around here, you don't start your businesses just because to make money. You started it because you had a greater, you saw something that's missing in our lives. Whether it's something very, um, you know, utilitarian or philosophical, whatever, you got into the business you got into because you saw a need that needed to be filled, fulfilled. That's why you started your businesses. And of course the money follows if you do it right and you're serving a real need. So, Michael, do you mind giving me just my tissue there, maybe? Um, on my seat, maybe, sorry. No, I didn't have it, sorry. Thank you, Chris, thank you so much. I told you we're partners, of Chris. So, we, um, so that's why I started my first company. And when I started that first company, another piece of the answer was starting to show itself in the, on the canvas. Because we had a sister company in Senegal, and we had a sister company in the US, and we had another bigger one in the Cayman Islands. That's where we were all linked. And I could not help but be shocked at the discrepancy in what we call the ease of doing business. How else do you explain this? This is Senegal, this is the US. Over here back then, it takes me 20 minutes or so to, build, to, uh, to register my business. Over here, by the time we finish registering, two years. Over here, to hire Chris here, we sign a piece of paper, we're good to go. Over here, we have to sign a piece of paper in three forms. I have to take myself, literally, physically, to a government's office, inspection du travail, labor inspection office, where some government official get to tell us if uh, Chris and I can work together. And by the way, he also has to get a, a, a health certificate from the doctor uh, certifying that uh, Chris is physically apt to do the job that we want him to do, even if it's a desk job. And this whole process can take months. Because you go to the office, the guy is not there, he's fooling around, there is a piece of paper missing, there is a law dating from Bonap Na Napoleon Bonaparte, I'm not lying, that you know, somebody can find whenever they want to mess with you. You know what laws are for, it's when they want to mess with you. Anyway, so this whole thing can take for, for, forever. Over here, Chris and I were done working together. Okay, bye, sayonara. It was nice meeting you. I never want to see your face again, but you know, two weeks we're done. Okay. Over here, the state have to give me approval to, get, to let go of Chris, and most of the time it's going to cost me money, even if Chris was stealing from me and causing trouble and all of that stuff never on time and everything is, is, uh, is uh, recorded. Over here, various forms of permits, licenses. It's a nightmare. Take literally for years. Over here, 
What did you say? Over here, you have um, a situation where the bank, uh, if I want to be, if I need to be paid $1,000 or to pay out $1,000, I need to get authorization from the bank in advance for that money to be able to move around. And the more, the higher that number is, and the more hoops and authorizations you need to get. And by the way, I can't get my money out of Senegal. One of my, uh, one of my associates, um, because he sent $50, 50, five zero out of Senegal three times, he got the uh, equivalent of the FBI going and giving him interrogations. It's like that about everything. So I ask you, would you, as a sane person, ever build a business? In which of these two countries would you build a business? Crazy Senegal, uh, um, USA over here, or Senegal, uh, no, Senegal over here, or USA over here? Who would build the businesses in Senegal? And who would do it in the US? That's it. That's it. I started to see it. That's it. But there I had my answer. And I, because at first I thought, oh, of course, it's because we're poor that we, it's, not, it's not happening for us. It's so hard to do business. And conversely, it's because we're rich that everything is so easy. Just come to think, wait a second, you're rich because, I mean, you don't, you're poor because you don't have enough money. At least not enough money because you don't, uh, not enough money because you don't have a source of income. What is the source of income for most of us? It's a job, isn't it? Where do jobs come from? Businesses or private sector, right? What does the private sector need? An enabling business environment, meaning, AKA, you make it easy to start and run a business. Yet you just told me that in these countries of ours, that's where it was the hardest for anyone to start and run a business. Mind boggling. The economic indexes, whether it's the uh, economic index of the world, uh, the doing business of the World Bank, or the heritage economic freedom indexes, they all saw the same thing that as an entrepreneur, I live on the ground every single day. So, why are some countries like mine poor and others rich? I come to understand Africa is the most overregulated re region in the world, and that's why it is the poorest region in the world. So when Chris talks about liberty, that freedom, it's that freedom we're talking about, economic freedom in this case. Any country that offers it to its citizens sees the magic happen, but only humans can do. But humans do that magic only when they're free. If they're not free, they can't do it. And those are the chains, those are the shackles that are still attached to my neck. And the sad thing about it is those shackles are invisible to most people because we're talking about the legal framework that these nations run on. We're talking about the legal framework, which is a software. This is a technology that these, people, these countries get to run on or not. Amazing. And then I had to discover another one, that if you don't pay attention, it is invisible also until it becomes um, threatened. I took it also for granted, our whole energy problems in Africa. There is this graph going around, I don't know if you saw it, it is mind-boggling. This graph that shows you that there is no, just like there is no country with low economic freedom that's rich, there is no country with low consumption of energy that is rich either. And it makes sense when you think about it. And that one too became my pet thief, because that one, especially right now, is in danger. As a matter of fact, both of these are in danger. Free market entrepreneur entrepreneurialism, free market capitalism, along with um, um, access to affordable, reliable, and abundant energy sources is under threat around the world. You guys might not feel the repercussions of those deteriorating, it's gonna happen over time because you started from so high. But us, we are the clearest case that you can make about this. Because we have not gone anywhere. And it is where nobody can argue with you that access to affordable, reliable, and um, abundant energy sources along with economic freedom, it's, it's a non-starter if you don't have it. So, do we sit here though now? Once I discovered that, guys, I have to tell you, 
It was another moment of falling on my knees. You know that feeling that you have when you know something is wrong. Maybe you have a physical ailment or you have a mental ailment. You're not well. And you go places, you go everywhere. You see all types of doctors and non-doctors. And everybody comes up with a reason as to why this is the case. Yet you feel as horrible and miserable as you do. And one day, you stumble upon this one person or this fact, and you're like, this makes sense. You know the feeling like, it's not like you're cured yet, but knowing, having the right diagnosis is half the solution. And this is one of the biggest issues with Africa. Most people have misdiagnosed the problem of Africa. Because we like to think that Africa is poor because of colonialism, slavery, racism, low IQ, you name it. As long as we think it's where it's at, we're not touching on the real solution. So here what's nice about, about that is, once you have a right diagnosis, then you get to work. So once I had that diagnosis, what did I do next? I started. I'm like, okay, if these, if these policies are a problem, then I have to get involved in policy reforms work. I mean, people, this is what passion and following what you really believe in takes you to. People think I'm an economist. I'm not an economist. I had to learn everything because I really, just like you, there's something wrong with you, and at some point you have to become your own doctor and your own advocate. And you find out a lot of things. That's what happened for me. So in this case, um, I started working with an, uh, um, an organization called Atlas Network, the largest organization of free market think tanks in the world. And as the, Africa, uh, as the director for the African Center for Prosperity, uh, we are overseeing all the um, free market think tanks that we invest in in Africa. And there, at some point, I'm like, OK, our partners are doing amazing work, and we need to continue supporting it. But I got to move much faster. Because every single year, I have millions and millions of young people who are coming to an age of work in Africa with yet no prospect for a job, nowhere. That is a ticking bomb for all of us. Not just us in Africa, but even for you sitting all the way here in America. So something much more radical needs to happen. I need to move faster. What do we do? Okay, if the business environment is what's wrong, we're gonna have to find a way to, in nation, bring a world class, I'm not talking an 80s type class, you know, business environment, because we live in a global world, and you better be the best, otherwise no one comes to you. And so this is why I started to look into the concept called the startup cities. Who here has heard of startup cities, charter cities, anything like that? Great. So the startup cities, the best way to think about it, for those of you who don't know, is when you go to a country and business environment is terrible, like mine, you know, uh, or the one in Honduras, where they are anywhere between 120 and 130 on a list of 194 countries, 95, 195, it's really bad, bad ranking. Basically, like I said, all except for five African nations, almost all the sub-Saharan African nations are in the bottom half of all of those rankings. We're terrible, we're doing very badly. So what you do when you go in a nation like that is, and you, if you think you can change the whole system all at once at the national level, it's a non-starter. What you do is you have to start uh, within a zone. So pick an area where there's relatively few people living so that you're not displacing anybody, you're not being accused of anything like that, and you're not in the way of anyone. Because when you're in the way of somebody, that's when trouble arises. Because the rest of the country, you have entrenched interests, and you also have the citizens themselves. Even if we can tell that things are dysfunctional, and they can tell it too, well, you know what? We, we still built our lives around it. So for you to change everything overnight, it's gonna be really hard, okay? So what you do is you do it zone by zone. So pick a rather unoccupied you know, plot of land the size of a city, and there proceed to put on it a different, a different operating software. And the operating, the operating software in here is the legal framework. The legal framework is nothing else, just what we would then call the business environment. You know when you use Google X or whatever, you're using it and you see what you're seeing. But what you don't see that really all of this is, is millions and millions and millions of lines of codes in the back. Our, our lines of codes are broken everywhere. They don't work, they're non-functional. So that's what needs to be changed. But if you try to change it from where it's at, like the piecemeal legislation we do, you're never gonna get anywhere, and meanwhile the kids are still coming and needing a job. So here you start fresh, and you just, you look at the piece of land as the hardware, and the legal framework that you put on it as the software. And we all know that 
If you run a top software, you're going to get somewhere. Sadly, right now, many of these zones in Africa are running on 80s software, which means worthless software. So that's what we've been uh, doing with these startup cities. And for that, it was important to have visionaries, people like you know, Chris here, who could really hear something like that. Because remember, many people, most people, I would say, have given up on Africa. One side has given up Africa. They wrote us off as just inferior, low, key, low IQ people. And another side is like, look, we spent a, a $1. trillion in aid on all of these people, on these people, and it didn't go anywhere. If you think something's going to work, whatever. So we're just like um, the, the, the basket case of the world. Yet you have people because they understand that it's all about liberty and energy, and they say, that's what you're working on? <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, it makes sense. And so those are the type of people we've needed all along, all along. I didn't need the $1.3 trillion foreign aid coming from people. I did not need people bringing me shoes, or Tom, like Tom's shoes. I did not need people bringing me all of this free stuff. We don't need that. We need economic freedom, like anyone else needs it. And we need energy access. And so when I see someone like Chris, I'm like, God, I didn't know you made people like this. I mean, the guy is involved in both sides. And the name of his company, I can tell he didn't wait for us to come around to. I mean, he's understood this forever. And so not only on the economic freedom, there he is putting his foot where his mouth is and saying, I believe in you, I believe in you Africans, that you know, given the same chances as the rest of us, you will thrive. That's what he did. And he, he was the first one. I'm very proud to say that. I called them, took less than 15 minutes. He said, I'm in. How often do I hear that? From people who, when you tell them about Africa, they're like, am I going to get a disease if I go there? What's going to happen to me? Right? So not only he does that, but on top of that, you know, you have this thing here called bettering human lives. And so I would encourage you, for anybody who doesn't have time to read the whole thing, go to page 74, read that whole section there, and look at this over here, because there too, Chris is being part of a solution. Chris and Anne. Anne is here. Hopefully you get to meet with her because she's the one who runs the foundation, right? And what they're doing here is something that as an African I can be proud of. Because when they're seeing that my grandma needs cleaner energy to, you know, prepare my bath. And also, by the way, I didn't tell you. Chris, you didn't know this. But Michael's always telling me last night, last night he said, you should say it. But it's, the other thing is, in the winter, and I know, Many people think Africa is always hot, you know, all of that. No, we have months, especially in Senegal, where you're literally under your covers. You're, it's cold, because we're by the ocean. It's cold, and we're in the northern hemisphere. And you know how grandma would heat me up and would heat us up? Imagine the ceramic um, vases that you use in your garden or on your patio. You know, you put your, your dirt in it, it's like maybe two and a half gallon or whatever. Well, grandma in there would put that much in coal, imagine and she would get it going, get it to the point where it's all hot red coal, because that, at that point, it's, it's emitting heat. And then she puts a little bit, incense, a little bit of incense on that, you know, for maybe for scenting or whatever. But bottom line is, as a kid, I hated that thing, because I would be coughing my, my, my lungs out, my eyes would be like burning and just, you know, it was horrible. But it's that, or you're cold. That's the other one. And so, my grandma needs something better than that. She needs something that's not going to kill her in the process to take care of me, you know? And you look in the back of this card, these numbers are indicting on the rest of us. These numbers on the people who are dying of indoor air pollution, it's rather tragic. We don't know what my grandma died of, but I know she died way too early. And I would not, I would not rule out that stuff. And so, there again, bettering human lives, what are they doing? They're thinking, okay, propane. Until something else shows up, because we know solar is not it for us. And if you tell me that you're going to bring me one more solar stove, you better make sure But I'm still, I won't say it, but you know exactly what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> what the ladies do with the solar stoves back home, they have them laying around. <laughs> and using them as uh, herb planters, just so you know. That's how well these things work. No, people like Chris and Anne are saying, we're not gonna patronize anybody. What's good enough for me is gonna be good enough for you because we're both humans, like Grandma said. So what are we gonna do? We need to work on bringing propane. And we're gonna do it in a market-based way. 
because we believe in you. You're human beings as anybody else. You don't need anybody's handout. Thank you very much. So they're doing it in a way where they're also promoting uh, other businesses. So it's basically relying on the market to bring accessible, affordable, and abundant energy source, in this case, you know, uh, propane, to African homes, and they're really going to the last mile. They're going to the places that almost no one can reach out. All the big infrastructures are not designed to reach my grandma in her little village. That's what they're working on. So you can only imagine, when I discovered people like Chris, I was just like, wow, just wow. And he's right. It's about liberty, and it's about energy. You give that to humans, stay out of the way, and watch them do the magic that humans do anytime and every time they're given that. Those are the only things that we humans need. And I will let you know one more thing. It's not just that um, liberty and energy is the difference between literally life and death. Those people would not be at the bottom of the ocean, falling off of airplanes, being sold. It's literally the difference between life and death to have those two. It's literally the difference between poverty and prosperity to have those two. It's literally the difference between being free and being captive, literally, for those of us who are slaves right now in Libya. But more importantly, it is also, and I will leave you with this, you know, when, I, uh, when we built uh, Skinny Skin, so we manufacture in Senegal, and our, our, customer, our biggest customer base in the U is in the U.S., Whole Foods Market is one of our biggest customers. And um, uh, the first time after we did everything, built uh, the manufacturing facility, hired everybody, trained and everything, and now we're going to start to produce for real, I think we're going to go to the U.S. I sat my team down, and we talked. I decided to explain to them that day why I am so monomaniacal, why I'm so crazy, and why I'm there doing what I'm doing. And I shared with them this, the same story I shared with you, the same. And there was this one of the ladies, 26 years old, her name is Yahara, never had a job before, never, because that's what happens in places with no jobs. And in life, she was waiting for a husband. That was her way out, a husband. And um, I saw her after I finished. She was over there, she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, I'm crying because up till now, because I see my someone like me, ourselves, being represented in magazines, in movies, in big posters, everywhere you go. I still see it sometimes going through airports, big poster, say this, say that, and the big you know, face of a black child looking less than and she said, I have come to believe that us Africans are inferior. I'm like, what? My heart sunk. I said, what? She said, yeah. How else would you explain otherwise? That the rest of the world has to do everything for us. They have to give us shoes, they have to give us clothes, they have to give us food. How else do you explain it? Perhaps we are inferior and we need to accept it. And I was like, whoa. And myself, I was starting to be like, hmm. And then she said, but that's not why I'm crying. And I said, why? Then why are you crying? And she said, because now I know that it is not true. Us Africans are not inferior. And when she said that, oh, you had to see her. The whole time I've known this young lady, she was always like this. Never, you know, when you have confidence, you know. When somebody has confidence, you know. And she's always like this and never even looks at me straight, anything. She's always looking down. And I said, and then she, when she, but when she was saying those words, now I know, but we're not. Mm, it was a physical transformation. You know, straight back, shoulders down, looking me straight in the eyes for the first time in my life since I've known her. And she said, I know it is not true. We are not inferior. Do you know what I was experiencing right there before my very eyes? I was experiencing human dignity. Somebody finally reclaiming her dignity. So liberty and energy, in addition to not only being the difference between death and life, however big that is, poverty and prosperity, freedom of being captive, it is the tool that gives human beings 
their dignity back. If you ask me what's the most important to humans, I will tell you without a flinch in my eye, it's dignity. And that is what is at stake. So with that, I thank you for your time this morning. I know there's a lot of demands on your time and you could be spending your time anywhere and you chose to spend an hour of your life, which is a big deal, because time is all that matters, and you came here. And I hope it was somehow useful. As far as I'm concerned, I want to thank you. Every time I tell my story, it's therapy. So thank you for being my therapist today. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. If you guys have questions or, yes, sir. I think she's coming with me. I've been in the oil and gas business for 44 years, and my company helps one of the largest natural gas or fertilizer companies buy natural gas. They convert natural gas to fertilizer. Well, there are only three kinds of fertilizer, and without the natural gas-based fertilizer, the, the world could only support three billion people. The most difficult place to get fertilizer to on the planet is sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at Peter Zihon, one of the demographers, very infamous, world famous demographer, he says that because of the drop in birth rates, 50% of the birth rates by 2050 will occur in sub-Saharan Africa, the most difficult place to get fertilizer and thus food. Are, th are the African, are African people aware of this train wreck that's coming down the road when we listen to the climate catastrophe folks that are the elitists that are proposing this, hey, we can do without fossil fuels at the expense of lives in Africa, I would say. It's perhaps to me the most racist, you know, belief, yeah. and yet nobody's being held accountable for it. So. That's right, that's right. Very good uh, comment and question. So the good news here when it comes to the, when it comes to the battle against the climate alarmism, that's how I call it, and the anti-fossil fuel zealots, that's how I call them. Uh, the good news is many Africans naturally and instinctively are on our, on, this, on our side, on the side of people who are saying, butt out, we need these fossil fuels. So I think on their own, instinctively, Africans are pro-fossil fuels. We are. And do you have a few people that are being paid by the um, by uh, some of these organizations, anti-fossil fuels, for sure. But the good news is the true sentiment is pro-fossil fuels. We understand that we need it and our people are demanding uh, you know, this access to affordable, reliable, and abundant uh, energy sources. Do they know what you just talked about? About you know, the, um, the need for getting the fertilizers there and it's, we're one of the hardest places to get these things to. Probably most people don't even know the ramifications of any of this stuff. But the good news is our people are supporting, you know, again, access to energy the way we know it. And um, these, through these cities, that's where we hope to be able to um, spearhead and, um, um, what's the right word? Um, it's not hijack. You know when your car is broken and somebody comes and gives you a Jump start, yeah. So we can jump start. So, so we can jump start, yeah. So we can jump start some of these efforts so that it can go much faster for adoption. That's really what we're doing. The problem is, if you're trying to do something at the national level or even getting the attention of some of these leaders on any of this stuff, they're going where the money is. And right now, let's be honest, they're being showered with money by the Western you know, uh, powers who are actually more WEF type powers. And so we have that to fight against. But what we do is we don't go head to head with it. We build uh, alternative paths on the side, on the side, and then eventually that takes over. That's really the whole plan. Yeah. Yes? Quick, quick question. Um, knowing that <clears throat> in Senegal specifically, 70% uh, of the population is age 35 yeah, and younger. Yeah. And I think that stat holds true largely across the continent. But now, uh, there is a new administration, there is a new regime, it was pushed by the youth. Do you see that as promising for the kinds of problems we need to solve? And is it potentially a petri dish for solutions more broadly? Yeah, you know, this is another one. I feel like um, for the longest time, 
I think we have been sold in Africa that, uh, the, that democracy equals necessarily prosperity. I believe in rule of law, for sure. But I think if you um, don't, what, we have, what has never been in the equation for us is this need for economic freedom. And as a matter of fact, so one of my worries with Senegal, so you could think it's a good thing, but I'm not one of those adepts of just get rid of people because get rid of people. And I'm afraid maybe in our country that's what we did because what happened, and not just Senegal, by the way, most of Africa, the youth is frankly tired, tired of all the siphoning of the very few meager resources we have, the siphoning of it by the, by the elites, right? The people in power. And the problem we have is when you have a youth that does not understand how prosperity, because that's really what it is that I hear them ask for, but that connection between economic freedom and energy and prosperity on the other end, not made by most of the youth. And as long as that remains the case, I am worried. That's one of the reasons why I wrote this book because I'm trying to establish the proper diagnosis as to why Africa is where it's at. So as long as we just kick this guy because he stole, and then we place another one, but we're not demanding anything different from that other person rather than just democracy, well, fine, you could have democracy all you want, but if you don't have this thing that's very critical, that for me, uh, the, the, founding block, the founding block of freedom, which is rule of law, then I'm not sure what else you're gonna have. And so all of it is just to say that in my country, I am not super uh, optimistic at the moment because our people um, don't understand that. And as a matter of fact, the two new people who are there in power, yeah, they're younger, but uh, they're, they're on the left, they're Pan-Africans on the left. These are people who still espouse the ideas of a Marxist socialist of back in the days. And by the way, this is another reason why Africa is where it's at. It's because during our um, so-called end of colonization times, when most of African nations were becoming you know, um, free, no longer colonized, starting in 57 you know, with Ghana and go on many more years on, my country get, you know, got um, decolonized in, uh, in April 4th, 1960. But the problem is, all of these African liberators, they had drunk the, the Kool-Aid of a Marxist socialist of the time. And that is something that we just have never revised. Never. We never have revised it. I can understand how we fell into it. Because back in those days, pretty much any even respectable economist, we have to remember, was a Marxist socialist. That was the ideology en vogue. And on top of that, we had the added um, thing where because we were just coming out of colonialism and the Marxist socialists were actually, it is true, the only ones who have been advocating for uh, racial equality back in those days. Even though Marx was a known um, you know, racist himself, regardless, the Marxist socialists were truly fighting for racial equality. And so between that and the fact that um, we were at a time when, you know, the Eastern Bloc was looking for influence down south, the Western Bloc was looking for influence down south, we conflated colonialism with, uh, with um, um, uh, capitalism, we then decided to side with the Marxist socialist people, and there we threw the baby out with the bathwater. So we let capitalism go sideways, and we embraced the other path. 60 some plus years later, we're still paying for that fateful decision of ours. So until and unless we revise that part of our history, and we revise this uh, heritage from our, from our um, uh, uh, leaders, from our um, you know, um, African liberators, I, I reckon that if you don't have a right diagnosis, you might be lucky, but I don't want to count on luck, but if you don't have a right diagnosis, there's no way you're gonna, fall on, you're gonna get to the right solution. And so my, uh, my response about that is, we, but we, not them necessarily, but we have found people on the continent that understand these things. And that's who we're working with trying to bring these startup cities on land. And the beauty there is there's 54 nations in Africa, 55 depending on how you count and who you recognize. All we need is one of those nations to say yes to this. We do it, the magic happened like happened in Singapore, Hong Kong, even China. Everywhere this thing has been tried, we see the magic happen, it happens once, and then everybody else can start to copy. And that is how in my lifetime, I believe, we're gonna see the change. So, not sure if it helps. Um, yes. <clears throat> Thank you for your time and uh, sharing your story. Uh, it's a good way that you explain, you understand the problem, you diagnose the problem, and you're trying to provide the solution. But you also stated the bureaucracy and the regulations that still exist, that a certain group, powerful, have 
for centuries, I would say, mm -hmm. have relied on to make their way of living or mm -hmm. that is still going to be a hindrance mm -hmm. to this. Yeah. How are you, uh, this is not just Senegal, I mean, yep. many places. Yep. How do you f see or what is your answer to addressing that? Yeah. Because people uprising is not the solution. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. It's right. a very good, yeah, it's a very good question. And so when you were hearing me talk about the startup cities, that's how we're addressing it. So we are basically uh, going to African nations, speaking to the leaders of these nations, but somehow, some, sometimes, many people have written off. They say, oh, these people are corrupt. They don't really want anything good for their, comp for their countries. But if you knew, oftentimes, how also, I mean, you know, people are all in a cahoot at some point. You could easily imagine that even if you had a leader that wanted to change everything, uh, do you think that the p powerful oligarchs who oftentimes actually own these presidents, literally, do you really think they're gonna let something go by? Do you really think that's an option for this person? You're in a way putting a target on their back if you're trying to change everything nationally and um, by doing so, threaten the interest of those people. No good. So this is why the startup cities is exactly that. It's a zone, a rather unoccupied piece of land that everybody has abandoned. People are not there, nobody cares. They don't want to be there. They decided there's nothing going on here. Think almost like Las Vegas back in the days. Super hot, who cares, who want to live there? But you, you know, or Dubai, Dubai is a better example. Dubai, plot of land, worthless plot of, of sand. You know, because people think Dubai, the oil, but actually I was, only recently was I reminded that Dubai didn't, couldn't rely on, there's no oil there for them. And so what does Dubai do? Well, Dubai said, we're gonna have to bring the operating software. And so imagine, so exactly that's what we do. We go to places where people have decided there's nothing there. Nobody cares, nothing there. And on that piece of land over there, you bring this new legal framework. This is where you're gonna have employment at will in a country that normally runs on, you have to go to the government office and all that crap. Uh, all the license, all of that stuff, streamlined. In a country where 20 million offices everywhere and everybody's eating somewhere, you know? The oligarchs are also part of it. Bank, the banking system remains the way it is because somebody's benefiting. Over here, you get to do something different. You see, for them, all they care about is not that you're doing, you're building something new. But what they care about is don't take away from them. So as long as the entrenched interests continue doing business the way they're doing it, all of that, you're not disrupting anything. And that's a key word, do not disrupt anything. Now you can go on the side, and so what we do is, instead of working with the people, you know like everywhere, you have people who have direct access to the, to the power. And they can do a lot of things. But then beneath that, you have a next layer. Maybe you have a cousin, you have a brother, all these people. They're close enough to the power, they can smell it, but they can't taste it. So it's with those people that usually we partner because they have access to the power to actually get an ear, the ear to the, to the power, explain what we're gonna do, and then we go do it over there with that second layer of power, of people who have access to the power. And then you go and you build something here. You're not taking away from the established people, so they leave you alone. And here you're building, and what you're building at some point also becomes a business for them. And eventually, as they start doing business with you, yeah, because you know, because also there are certain ways in which you, know, you make sure that everybody is, is, uh, you know, is, seeing, is, is uh, seeing the incentives of seeing this work. And then eventually they also start doing business with you, you're a customer, you know, if, if they have a good, um, what do you call it, if they have a good um, uh, construction company, why, why, why should we not try to give them you know, some of the deals? But then by doing business with you this way, they're starting to be like, oh, wait, you mean I don't have to sell my soul? Uh, to, to stay in business, you mean I can have um, property that's gonna be mine at the end of the day where if I say something about the president, nobody still can take it away from me? Wow, that's what freedom really is. I prefer to do business this way. You know, this is how you eventually change, you know, those dynamics with time. You know, um, where we have done this is pros Prospera in Honduras, and um, we there, I mean, Honduras, I mean, one of the gang capitals uh, with drugs and all of that in the world. We're doing something like that there. Do you think we have issues and problems with any of, any of the people that you can think of like that? No. They leave us alone. And they leave us alone, why? Because we leave them alone. We're doing our thing. We have nothing to do with the rest of what's going on. Here we just established a better business environment. By the way, Honduras on its own, 120 to 130. This, this zone, if it was a country on its own, 
Deloitte calculated that we would be num we are number nine on the Doing Business Index ranking, one of the top ten in the world, up there with Denmark, Singapore, Hong Kong. So for me, it's just like you see. Sometimes they say when you go to battle, don't go for frontal. You'll just get knocked down. It's too much. Go for the flanks, and that's that's what we're doing. We're going for the flanks, and eventually they meet, but they meet in a way where we win. And we have changed the culture, in even in terms of what does it mean to do business, because let me tell you, any business person who gets over here to, be, to do business cleanly and over here, it's like all of these hoops you have to jump through. I mean, I've seen some of these people, some of these business people, and it's funny, this re weird, sick relationship that they have with power, because they think they own the power, but the power also owns them. How else do you explain? So this is one country, uh, you know, we're talking to the president to, and you have a business people. First of all, do you know that when it's the, when it's the, uh, the um, what do you call it? When it's the, um, the birthday of a president, he will summon, it's almost like you guys are all in this one country. And the only reason your businesses are working is because you pledge allegiance to him as well. And probably some of the money you make has to go over there too. But that's how you get to keep your businesses and keep growing. Imagine if when it's his birthday or whenever he has a party that he wants all of you to go to, you can't even say my child is sick. You better show your face. Otherwise, you might see it differently. And your business is going to suffer if you're not flat out yourself in jail. Now, imagine you go to the party. Let's say you two are married. You brought your wife. And he comes. There you go. And then you come. He comes. The president is there. And he's like, come. I need to dance with you. You better get up. You go dance with him. So they're touching you from everywhere. All of that stuff. Your husband is right there having to watch this. But if he doesn't do that, the business is dead the next day. So you see this sick relationship that's between those two parties. And you can imagine that when they discover what it is to do business freely, <laughs> that their money is theirs, it's going to be, they don't have to jump through hoops or kiss ass to anybody. Do you, do you think they realize at that point the, the, the value of being able to do business under conditions like that? And so that's eventually how you do it, but you're not there to patronize anybody. You're just there and you do business in a different way, in a way that doesn't encroach on anybody else. And then eventually, the transformation starts to happen. And that's how eventually I think we're going to change this. But not the way oftentimes I feel the US is trying to do it with all of these sanctions and all of these things that are so confrontational. Then the youth is looking at all of this and thinking the US is co committing imperialism and then hating on the Americans and then wanting to side with the, with the Chinese because they say, oh, at least the Chinese don't patronize us. You see, there is soft power at stake here as well. But we're not going to earn you know, the heart and the minds of uh, people, especially young people, if this is how we continue doing things. And I do believe that these startup cities truly, if the US really understood anything, they should see it as a form of foreign policy. Meaning like America sharing the very best of America with the rest of the world in a manner that you win minds and hearts. And I really hope we get to accomplish that in the process as we do that. I, I think that's going to be a byproduct of this, in addition to everything else we're going to be able to create. So that's how we're going about it. And so far, so far, history has been on our side because we're not doing anything new. We're just doing it in different places. But there has been worse places who had adopted this, and it worked for them. So we just need to find the door, and we're finding the door. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I mean, I will, to the, to, the, to, the, to the risk of repeating myself, I will say it again. Um, I think um, perhaps, you know, at some point we'll be able to talk about it some more openly, but I think um, the initiative that people like Chris and others have taken to say, we believe in this, it's, it's really hard to find people who, who would, you know, partake in this idea. 
right? And so when you say, what can we Americans do? And again, as people who don't wait for anybody to get things going, I think business people are traditionally like that. We don't wait for the state to get it right. So if the, if the, the government of America doesn't get it, and that this should be what they go for, although I've heard both sides uh, say this is really probably one of the most promising you know, initiatives uh, for going forward. So I think as an American, the problem with Americans is they have totally given up, given up on Africa. You know, like it's just, it doesn't even, almost doesn't even exist. And um, I think very, America used to tend to be interested in Africa just for, you know, um, um, army bases, you know, being able to be positioned here and there for geo geo geopolitical, you know, um, considerations. But I do think it's the people in this room and the people like the people in this room who will actually make something happen and establish something before the administrations, it doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat or something else, um, notices what we're doing. At some point, they'll lend us support, right? But right now, I think this is an effort that is coming from the bottom up. And that's really what we've been engaged with, you know, including with, with, with Chris, who's just been like, yeah, I see this. And so um, if you ask what can we do, it's how we do it. We have to have to do business with one another. To me, that's the best thing. Don't patronize people. Don't tell them what they, they should be doing. You're a business person. We believe in business. Do business together. Because in doing business together, we get to know each other. That's, that's one of the best things. You get to know each other. And then uh, in the minds of um, young Africans, they will see you for what you're being, a trade partner. And once that happens, it's going to be really hard for anybody else to keep doing the propaganda that they've been doing. But you know what else is, hap what is happening right now? So when America is just like, okay, we just send you foreign aid. And by the way, our foreign aid is attached to our own personal agenda. You have many countries that are being told, if you don't adopt this agenda, and I won't even go into some of, uh, some of the cultural agendas that they want us to adopt into, then we're going to withhold the money from you. If you don't do this, we're going to withhold the money from So it's all forms of uh, neocolonialism, if you, if you want to call it that way. Where with the Chinese, you know, and I like to say the CCP, because most businesses, uh, uh, Chinese businesses in Africa, a, third, a good third of them at least, is backed by the CCP, probably more. And so there what's happening, young people are seeing Chinese people doing business with them. They're not happy with everything, but at least they're seeing them doing business with them. Uh, also, the Chinese have these programs where they're sending a lot of young African people, so among our brightest, they're giving them full scholarship rides to China. When they come back, their mouthpiece is for, for, for China. Um, we have Confucius schools all over the continent. Um, I'm not even going to go into some, some of the propaganda that's happening about, you know, um, you know, our ways are better than their ways and all of that stuff, and all of that stuff. So all of this is happening, and the Americans are nowhere to be seen. Now, for me, the Americans to be somewhere to be seen doesn't mean I want, you know, uh, American guns and uh, American, no, none of that. I think this route will be the best route. I think doing business with one another, where people, there is a win, 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 that's the way. And that's what people in this room know how to do. And so I say people in this room get activated because that's what's going to make the change. And it might seem small to you, given the size of a problem, but everything starts somewhere. And you would be shocked how fast things go when you get to it. And one of the things about Africa is most, like I said, most of the world has, has given up on us. So who are we left with? The CCP and the Russians for the most part, and Europe, primarily France. But the French, the French, they, they always took us for granted. So technically, they don't really exist. That's why the Chinese and the Russians are literally taking over for them, from them. Where is America? Yet this continent, by 2050, one out of every four people walking this earth will be African. Africa has the youngest population in the world. The average age is 19 years old, one nine. What are we doing? But again, we don't want guns. We don't want any of that stuff. I say we do business with Africans, we, we, we show, we share with Africans the power of the free markets. They need to, f to live it in their bodies, they need to live it in their lives, and they need to see the transformational change of it, the power of liberty and energy. We do that, You've, you, just, um, you just had a quarter of a world population join your cause, share in the philosophy, all of that. And it happened without a drop of the blood without a bullet shot, nothing. It happened in the most beautiful way. It happened in a way that happens when people are dealing with one another win, 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 and it's all based on trade.
Thank you again for everything. Have a wonderful day.